Okay, now we'll have our, our scripture reading this morning. This is from the book of John, chapter 20, 19 through 31. That evening, Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Catherine. Will you pray with me? this morning. Oh Lord God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. For we know that you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. In this morning's gospel reading, we hear about the disciple Thomas, who has been given the dubious nickname, Doubting Thomas. Now, we've given him this name because he didn't trust the reliability of his fellow disciples when they said they saw Jesus. But I think we need to challenge that. Was this a fair assessment of Thomas? Was this really a, a fair analyzing of who he really was? Or maybe does the doubt that we think Thomas has strike a chord at our own hearts? Does it remind us that inside all of us is a healthy dose of cynicism that looks critically at stories, at news, at gossip, at the grocery store tabloids, you know, when you're getting in the checkout line, there they are, those headlines... Bigfoot made my sister pregnant, or whatever they say, I don't know. All those things we hear about that cause us to raise our eyebrows and, and just wonder. I dare say that inside each of us, isn't there a doubting Thomas? Maybe that's why John put this story in his gospel. Maybe it's so we can 
deal completely and critically with something outside of the realm of our normal life. We don't doubt Christ's crucifixion. We don't doubt that Jesus walked the earth. Those are the normal things that we, we, we know that's in our, our frame of mind. We don't doubt that he was a great teacher and a charismatic leader. Those things are easy to accept. They're inside the realm of our average, everyday portions of life. But sometimes those things that are on the outside, just beyond the fringe of what we can accept, that's where the doubts come in. I mean, I don't have to remind you, over the past several years, we have heard the term fake news. We're learning to doubt media. We're, we're, we're learning to doubt the biases behind things. Have we grown into cynics? Have we become doubting Thomas-like characters? But like I said, is this really fair to Thomas? Though we know little about him, the little that tells a lot about him, we kind of hear about his character. We, Catherine read he was nicknamed the twin. Do we know who his twin brother was? But we also know that Thomas was a brave follower of Jesus. Let's look at John eleven sixteen. 16. Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may, that we may die with him, Jesus. Now, a person doesn't commit themselves to that sort of future unless they are loyal and truly brave. He obviously believed in his master, Jesus, and he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. So what, what caused this brave, loyal follower to doubt the statements by his fellow apostles that Jesus was risen from the dead and that they had seen him. Maybe it was because he was so disappointed at the events that had happened before that. Jesus was crucified, died a horrendous death, and put in a tomb who would not be emotionally traumatized by those events. And then to be told that Jesus was alive, was that just almost too much to comprehend? It's like the old saying goes, burn me once, shame on you. Burn me twice, shame on me. Thomas just was dealing with the intense reaction of losing Jesus. Thomas was willing to die for Jesus. And like I said, Jesus died. His faith was rocked. And Thomas's reaction just, could just come from that, an honest reaction. Thomas was a brave and loyal follower of Christ. Perhaps his doubting was more from great disappointment. And his words, his confession, my Lord and my God. Doesn't that reflect faithfulness and not doubt? Thomas gets a bad rap. I really think so. But without his doubt, we would never know that our doubts are part of our Christian journey. Jesus did not chastise Thomas for doubting. I 
I dare say when it comes to doubts, we all have them from time to time. Isn't it good to know that Jesus won't reject us? Amazingly, it's said that most atheists, people that say they don't believe there is a God, are actually just angry at God. Too often, we find the people who have passed through a difficult time with maybe that loss of a loved one or other things considered that God let them down. If God didn't answer prayer, then he must not exist. That's a hard one. But I want to tell you when you doubt, carry your questions to God. Ask Him to show you another perspective. Doubt can sometimes be one of the greatest catalysts to move us forward. God isn't afraid of your questions. So let's go back to our gospel reading. Let's set the scene a little more. Let's do like Sophia on the Golden Girls. Picture it. Easter is a week behind us. Use your imagination. Picture it. We're in a little room in Jerusalem. There is a handful of frightened people behind closed and locked doors. These doors were locked. John makes sure that we know that. The people inside were locked up tight. Behind the doors, maybe behind piles of furniture blocked up against the doors, blinds of drawn, curtains, whatever, nobody moved in case someone could hear footsteps on the floor. They were afraid of the Jewish people the leaders, anyone that might come for them because they were followers of Jesus. They were hunkered down. And who was there? Well, not Thomas. So we don't know. Judas wasn't. So there at least 10 if Thomas wasn't. But that, probably, that wasn't just who was there. You can imagine Mary and the other women being there. And Mary trying to convince them once again that he had seen, they, she had seen Jesus in the, t at the garden. That they sat there, afraid, not knowing what to do. And suddenly, Jesus was among them. He just came into the room, just appeared. doesn't say he knocked on the door. Hello, is anybody home? He appeared. And he says, peace be with you. Not just once, but twice. Peace be with you. And then John says they rejoiced. Those that were there rejoiced. Jesus was alive. And afterward, they tried to tell Thomas, but he couldn't go along with the story. Maybe he thought they were setting him up for something. I mean, he had accepted tall tales he'd heard before, but sometimes those tall tales were just tall tales. But remember Thomas and the story of Lazarus. When Jesus got word from uh, Mary and Martha that Lazarus was dead, Thomas, who was with him, said, we will go with you. 
fully expecting it was too late to do anything for the family except to comfort them in their loss. So at that moment, Thomas had courage. Maybe not so much hope. And then also, when Jesus was saying that those those well-remembered words about going to prepare a place for them, because Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, Thomas was there, listening intently. And Jesus kept saying, and you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? <clears throat> and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father. You know and have seen him. And then there's Philip, who we can think of in this instance as also a doubter. Because Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and we shall be satisfied. Jesus answered Philip and probably included Thomas in his next question, possibly shaking his head as one might at a stubborn child. He said, have I been with you so long and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? So, oh, we like to show Thomas as the doubter after the resurrection. Truly, Thomas and Philip and probably the other disciples had other doubts had other questions long before this about Jesus, about Jesus and his relationship to God the Father. In today's gospel story, Thomas was so hung up on the description of the sign that he missed the significance of their testimony. Thomas demanded something physical. He demanded a sure sign. He probably took pride in his, just show me. Maybe he was from Missouri. Show me. I mean, the followers as well as the disciples were constantly asking for signs which could be called the mighty acts of Jesus. We can certainly identify with Thomas I believe that there are people in this church this morning who would have had doubts like Thomas, each for their own reason. And we don't know where Thomas was. We don't know why he chose not to be there in that locked room. We don't know how he felt being left out of that major life-changing experience for the disciples. Did you think they were just trying to pull one over on him, like I said? Nana, nana, boo, boo, we were here, you were won't, you weren't. These are questions that we as humans deal with. The disciples, we have to remind ourselves, were just as human, as imperfect as we are. And so now we come to the, the day that was a week after Jesus' appearance to the disciples. And they were once again behind closed doors. But this time, Thomas was there. And Jesus saying, peace be with you. And then he spoke directly to Thomas, knowing what was in his heart. 
as Jesus always seemed to know. He challenged Thomas, the skeptic, to go ahead and make the test. He also knew how Thomas would react. Can we imagine how Thomas felt faced with that undeniable truth with the reality it doesn't need fingers poking. Thomas was face to face, toe to toe, with the Word of God made flesh. God incarnate. The Son of God, the Father, risen from the tomb he was probably frozen in place. All he knew to do was to fall at Jesus' feet. And all he could say was, my Lord and my God. No apology. No defending himself. No chip on the shoulder for being put on the spot. Simply that spontaneous, amazing statement of faith. My Lord and my God. Thomas knew of the visible manifestations of God of old. When God appeared to Adam and Eve, to Abraham, and the uh, many occasions when the angel of the Lord spoke to people. But this, this was Christ in the flesh, not confronting Thomas, but loving Thomas. So Easter Day has come and gone. Where are we? Where are you? <clears throat> are you like Thomas, the doubter who said he couldn't accept such nonsense about the resurrection? The Apostle Paul said that Christian belief in the living Lord was a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the Gentiles. So look around you this morning. Are you ready to be a fool for Christ and say with the now believing Thomas, my Lord and my God? I shared in my pastor's pen that this day is often thought of holy humor day because people celebrate the resurrection and realize that God played a joke on Satan. Satan thought Jesus was dead, but guess what? Ta-da! He's not! I was going to try to find some really good joke to tell you, but I couldn't find one. I'm sorry. I'm sure you all have your own. But can we be like Thomas and say, my Lord and my God? In the weeks after Easter, Let's seek to have a deeper relationship with God. I mean, Easter, after Easter is sometimes called letdown Sunday or low Sunday, all those things too, but that's not what Easter is about. There is an old song we used to sing, every morning is Easter morning from now on. Every Sunday is Easter Sunday because we're celebrating the risen Lord. Easter should just be the beginning of a spiritual renewal and revival and striving to deepen your faith and understand. And while there may be some Thomas in all of us, there's also the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us. 
It's not a time for doubting Thomas. It's a time for brave, faithful followers. Because that's who Thomas really was. Thanks be to God. And amen.